From the JAMA Network, this is JAMA Clinical Reviews, interviews and ideas about innovations in medicine, science, and clinical practice. Hello, and welcome to this JAMA author discussion. Today, we will be speaking with Dr. Melanie Calvert, senior author of the JAMA paper, Ethical Considerations for the Inclusion of Patient-Reported Outcomes in Clinical Research, the PRO Ethics Guidelines. Dr. Calvert is a professor of outcomes methodology and director of the Center for Patient-Reported Outcomes Research at the University of Birmingham. She is an expert in quality of life research and has led multiple international initiatives to standardize the use of patient-reported outcomes in clinical research. I'm your host today. My name is Ethan Bash, and I am a JAMA Associate Editor for Oncology and an oncologist and outcomes researcher at the University of North Carolina. And as a researcher on patient-reported outcomes myself, I am particularly excited about today's discussion. Welcome, Dr. Calvert. Thank you, Dr. Bash and Gemma, for this kind invitation. Really delighted to be here today. Terrific. Well, I think we'll get started by talking about some of the basics. I'm hoping you could just briefly describe for the audience what's meant by a patient-reported outcome or a PRO, and how can they be used in clinical trials? Yeah, so patient-reported outcomes are reports of a patient's health status that are reported directly by the patient, and they're usually assessed using validated questionnaires. They can be used to provide valuable insights into the impact of disease and treatment on patient symptom burden, functional status, emotional well-being, and health-related quality of life. Now, it's been argued by yourself and by others that without capturing the patient voice in clinical trials, for example, through patient-reported outcomes, we'll be left with an incomplete picture of the true patient experience with the intervention, such as drugs. And a number of international regulatory authorities and patient organizations have called for inclusion of PROs in clinical trials to capture the patient experience. But your work and others have pointed out that often PROs are, in fact, not included in trials. I'm wondering if you could comment on why you think this is and what you feel is needed to increase the use of PROs in clinical trials. Thanks. So I think that's a really interesting question. And I think the first thing to note is that we really don't have an accurate current picture on the global use of patient-reported outcomes across all trials and settings. Um, work by Vodica and colleagues, which was published some time ago now, looked at the use of patient-reported outcomes until 2013. And at that time, the use was increasing, and about 30% of trials registered on clinicaltrials.gov were using patient-reported outcomes. I think more recently, work by Van der Hoot and colleagues looking at use of patient-reported outcomes in pragmatic trials has shown that there appears to be a potential increase in use with around 57% of trials, including PROs. But I think internationally, notably, there seems to be low use in paediatric trials. So that's definitely a priority area for methodological development. But let's go back to your question about why aren't they included in trials? I think there's a number of things here. Um, Firstly, I think it probably relates to them still being regarded as subjective measures and a lack of understanding on how the data can be beneficial and used And secondly, I think that some studies have methodological issues. Um, We often see high levels of missing data from patient-reported outcomes, which makes the outcome data difficult to interpret. Um, And so I think those are two key challenges. So in order to address those issues, I think we really need a couple of things at least. So we need evidence of demonstrable impact arising from the use of patient-reported outcomes including things like the use of patient-reported outcome data to inform regulatory decision-making, labelling claims, and clinical guidelines and care. And I believe we do now have some really good examples of PRO data being used in those sorts of ways to demonstrate impact, but we need to further build on that evidence base so that people realise the benefits of collecting these data and can encourage the uptake and use. I think another key point I'd like to make is that we need to improve PRO methodology And the good news here is that over recent years, including work with yourself, Ethan, we've developed a number of international guidelines to help support high quality PRO data collection. So that's included protocol guidance, such as the Spirit Pro uh, guidelines published in January 2018, um, reporting guidelines such as Consult Pro, and also the PRO ethical guidelines, which are now published in JAMA. More broadly, some of the international efforts that we see, such as the work of the Proteus Consortium, which is aiming to promote the tools and resources to optimise the use of PROs in trials, 
or help ensure that patients, clinicians and other decision makers can really make the best decisions about treatment options. So I think that will also facilitate high quality use of PROs. And there's other important international initiatives as well, such as the CSIQL IMI, which is trying to improve analysis of these data. So together, these international guidelines and initiatives are going to play a really crucial role in seeing the greater use of PROs and supporting their use in high quality data collection. And I think one final point I'd like to make, and I would also be really interested to hear your thoughts on this, Ethan, is that we really mustn't forget the other key drivers of change. You, you've mentioned the regulatory agencies, and I think that the FDA have done fantastic work on their patient-focused drug development series, and also their MHRA in the UK and the European Medicines Agency. They're going to play a crucial role in trying to ensure use. And patients themselves, they really want to know how the, the, their disease, how treatments that they're offered are going to impact on their symptoms and on their quality of life. So the patients themselves can really play a critical role in driving increased use and change of these measures. Thanks, Mel. You know, I, I think all of those are such excellent points. And, you know, you clearly have such command of the landscape and the changes over time. Yeah, I, I'm happy to weigh in as well. And again, this is my opinion. It doesn't represent JAM, although my role here interviewing is as a JAMA editor, but this is my own opinion as an investigator. So I agree with all the points that you've made. Um, from a very practical standpoint, I think that part of this is logistics. You know, when looking, say, at drug development, industry drug development and you know, regulatory types of trials, my sense of the field is that often the teams developing the trials don't necessarily have PRO expertise. It's not part of their mindset. And so thinking about bringing the patient voice into the trials is not part of the initial design or the plan. You know, often the timelines are extremely aggressive and the teams are really just focused on the basics. What do they absolutely have to do? And by the time PROs become part of the discussion, it's pretty late in the game. And so the way that they're integrated into the trials is not necessarily as rigorous as one might like. And, you know, I, I agree with you that uh, regulatory authorities like FDA and EMA have really been terrific advocates for PROs, but I actually think they could push more. Uh, I think that including PROs in trials needs to be front of mind for investigators. And I think it's the regulators ultimately who determine what the sponsors focus on. I think in academic trials, it's a little bit different. I think, again, similar problem, which is the people who are designing the trials aren't necessarily PRO experts. Now, I will say, I think the landscape has really changed tremendously. And I think that's thanks to you and others who have brought the concerns and the issues and the methods around PROs to the forefront. And I think they're much more in the vernacular now than they ever used to be. I want to move on to some other questions, though, because uh, I'm really interested in your input. And work by you and others has pointed out that even when PROs are included in a trial, right, let's say that you get past all of the, the stuff that you and I are talking about, even then, there's still often limitations. I wonder if you could reflect on some of the main limitations and what you feel is needed to improve the field. And I, I, you know, I think some of this is captured in your new JAMA paper as well. Thank you. Yeah, so I, th I think there are a number of key limitations. And I think what you've just said totally resonates. And I'll highlight three main ones today. So firstly, there does need to be a clear rationale for assessment. And that is about thinking early on in the study design, why you're assessing the patient reported outcomes and having really clearly defined objectives. In our review of trial protocols, um, that we've undertaken, we've often found very limited information on this. And it's really crucial that the research teams consider how the data is going to be used at a very early stage, whether they're planning to use it to inform regulatory decision making, um, whether it's for clinical decision making, clinical guideline development. And also, crucially, are they going to be using the PROs to assess efficacy, tolerability? You need to really think up front, what is your question? Why are you assessing these data? And then make sure that you capture that in a really robust way that directly addresses those objectives within your trial. I think secondly, we really need to make sure that we've got high quality data capture and make sure that we minimise missing data so that with the data that we do collect from patients in this way is really reliable and robust and can be used for to generate evidence. And finally, we need to really make sure that the results are reported. And we flag this in the ethics paper in JAMA. So 
In our recent review of uh, 160 cancer trials, we found that patient reported outcome data were collected from nearly 50,000 individuals that was not reported. And on average, these patients were completing around six assessments per trial. So they were giving up substantive amounts of their time to do this. And, And this is unethical and hinders the use of these valuable data to inform patient care. Those responses really resonate for me, and I think that's really right on. And um, what I particularly appreciated about your paper is the ethical underpinning of this, which is that interventions are being developed for patients. They ultimately have impact on patients directly. And if we don't understand the patient experience with those interventions, we're really missing a fundamental element of the characteristics of those interventions, whether they be drugs or devices or otherwise. So I really like the ethical framework for thinking about why there's a responsibility to have rigor and completeness in in these data. I want to finish up just with one more question, which is related to this ethical underpinning, right? So again, an angle of the paper is that there's this moral or ethical foundation for getting PROs right in trials. I wonder if you could reflect on how this really can be thought of as an ethical issue and how this type of framing might help advance the field, for example, to overcome some of the barriers that you alluded to earlier. Yeah, I think that addressing the ethical issues of proclinical research is really important um, because it has. we need to do this to ensure that we have the high quality PRA data collection that we've talked about. But crucially, we also need to minimise participant risk and burden and harm and crucially to protect participant and researcher welfare during the research studies. There are a number of ethical concerns that have been raised regarding PRO data collection. And I think one of these is that patient reported outcomes are increasingly being collected both in research and in routine clinical care. And that can lead to real uncertainties for either participants within research or patients within routine clinical settings about why the data are being collected, how they're being used. And One important area is that there's a lack of guidance on how research personnel should manage situations where patient reported data reveal concerning levels of psychological distress or symptoms. And I think it's really important that we address this because if concerning data are not managed appropriately, then those data could lead to suboptimal participant care or biased trial results. I think there's other elements which we've drawn out within the paper, which talk about the need for patient reported outcome research to reflect the perspectives of underserved groups, such as older individuals, those are socioeconomically disadvantaged populations and racial and ethnic minority groups. And that could threaten the scientific validity of results if we don't collect the patient reported data from all of these patients. So we need to really consider this and the importance of collecting patient reported data that is equitable as well. So I think Ultimately, the use of the new PRO ethical guidelines published in JAMA will help research teams and also the patients that are hopefully involved in the co-design of those studies, and crucially the research ethics committees as well, to help consider these sort of issues at an early stage and make sure that we do have that higher quality data that can then meaningfully inform care and really answer the questions that patients want answered for them. It's so well said, Mel. You know, it's such a reminder of why we do research, right? Research is done to better the situation of patients, of individuals, and it's therefore an obligation ethically of investigators to make sure that we are serving the both the participants in the trials and the patients who would ultimately benefit through doing it the way that it should be done. So uh, thank you for that reminder. I'd like to thank our guest today, Dr. Melanie Calvert, for a rich and informative discussion on the inclusion of patient-reported outcomes in clinical research. I'm Ethan Bash, and it's been a pleasure serving as your host for this podcast. This episode was produced by Daniel Morrow at the JAMA Network. The audio team here also includes Jesse McWhorters, Shelley Steffens, Lisa Hardin, Audrey Foreman, and Mary Lynn Farkaluk. Dr. Robert Golub is the JAMA Executive Deputy Editor. To follow this and other JAMA Network podcasts, please visit us online at jamanetworkaudio.com. Thank you for listening.